Bob of the day, another 50 cents. It's uh, the podcast. It's the Bob McCallum podcast featuring John Shannon. Whoa, I, am I in the title now? No, you're not in the title. You're, you're after featuring. Oh. You're on like the third line. Wait, wait, wait. This is progress, Bob. No, it's this not is progress, progress at all. It is progress. You've made my day. I feel so much better. That's what I live for, John, is to make your day. <laughs> uh, and joining us um, is the CEO of Uninterrupted Canada, but better known as the former uh, president of uh, Sportsnet and all television and radio properties, and even better known as Thing 2. Here is uh, Scott Moore. Look at you. I, I still have the T-shirt. It says Thing 2. Uh, Judy really? Davey from Molson sent us, uh, sent Keith and I Thing 1 and Thing 2 T-shirts back when you first named us that. Now you're referring to Keith Pelly. Have you talked to him? Do you, do you still stay in touch with him? Yeah, I keep in touch with him. I talk to him uh, every couple of weeks. He's... He's doing great. Last I talked to him, the uh, the European tour was just getting back up right. and running, so he was he was busy. But the previous six to eight weeks, he said, had been the toughest weeks of uh, his career because they were worried just about cash flowing and making sure that the tour offices were going to stay open. He had to furlough some people. Yeah, they went through uh, they went through some tough times, but I think they're coming back pretty well. Welcome uh, to the rest of the sports media world, right? Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, look, before we get into some meat and potatoes here, um, take a second, tell us, there there got to be some people out there who don't know what Uninterrupted Canada is, and maybe you can uh, give us the uh, very brief synopsis of uh, the company. Sure, Uninterrupted was formed by LeBron James. Uh, it's his athlete empowerment platform. So it's a digital platform. Uh, it produces content mostly from the athlete's voice. Uh, and in the States, they do deals with uh, Disney, ESPN, Fox for long form programming. And then they do a lot of uh, short form digital programming. So we're the first international expansion of that. Uh, LeBron is a partner. Drake is a partner. Then my uh, Canadian uh, business partner, Vinay Vermani, is the chief content officer. And I'm the CEO. We've done a, a deal with Bell Media where they're our distribution partner. We've done our first long form documentary last November, which was on Serge Ibaka going back to the Congo right. uh, with the Larry Ryan Trophy. We've got another documentary coming up uh, on the Nurse family and uh, and their sort of dominance of, uh, of their individual sports. And we do uh, short form content as well. And we did something with Serge Ibaka called the VEC class that went a little viral in the fall. We have a, a, a couple of other branded content series. And we went through a little slowdown in, uh, during COVID, but things are uh, rushing back uh, in the last week or so. We're having a tough time keeping up. Good. You sound, uh, you, you sound busy, though. Yeah, it's, it's busy. It's fun. It's different. It's a little bit more hands-on. We've got a small team. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's a fun team. And I think if you add up the ages of everybody else on the team, you come close to getting to my age. Oh, man. That's old. <laughs> everybody's young. Yeah, everybody's young. <laughs> well, that's it's great. As I, was uh, as I was reminded somewhere earlier, this might be the world's oldest podcast. So, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and bring, you're not I bringing bring the, the age days. down much more. No. I got news for no. you. <laughs> So and you've, uh, you're like number one or two of sports podcasts in Canada right now, Bob. Well, it comes and goes, you know, I yeah. don't know. I can't keep track. You mean the one featuring John Shannon? Yeah. The, <laughs> that same one. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's good. And ain't no telling how, can you be higher than number one? Cause if I get rid of you, no doubt we'll go up. <laughs> yeah. But oh, you are know, you talking I'm, to, you talking to Scott? No, yeah. I'm talking to oh, you. You sorry. know who I'm talking to. <laughs> the celebrity guests really drive it. And this is the, the best you could do. Somebody who's actually once met Drake and once met LeBron. That's that's the biggest celebrity you can get. About. Yeah, what, what's LeBron like? LeBron's actually a great guy. They, uh, the, the funniest thing was at our launch last August, uh, I introduced him on stage. And he came up, and I should have gotten a lesson from Adam Silver as to how to how to hug an NBA player and not look like a geeky old guy because I looked like a geeky old guy. But he got up and said, "We're 
we're thrilled to be in Canada and it's all because of my brother Scott Moore, which I thought was, I, I turned to my wife, we were standing off stage and said, I think the best NBA player in history just called me his brother, which is pretty cool. That yeah, might, really cool. might have been a career, career highlight. Uh, inaccurate, but very cool indeed. And, <laughs> yes, yes. And, uh, and by the way, uh, if you need Drake, uh, he's, uh, he, he lives right over there. He's about a drive on a four iron from me. So don't yeah. worry about it. He used to live, uh, I'm, I'm at our condo at the Ritz Carlton downtown, and he, uh, he used to live on the 41st floor. Uh, so no, we'd see that was while he was building. He now has uh, now has a little shack in uh, Bridal Path. Okay, okay, you two name droppers. The closest I got to Drake was Degrassi. Okay, that's it. <laughs> All right. I mean, that's you it. And you watch his place is his place is so big. He thinks yours is his garden shed, right? Oh God, yeah. I think he's got <laughs> sixty thousand square feet. He can land his wow. plane in the backyard, can't he? I mean, isn't that well? Uh, not quite, but he could certainly land a helicopter. He may even have a helicopter yeah. pad on the roof, for all I know. Mm -hmm. yep. So, because, are you watching any hockey? Watching uh, a fair bit of hockey, not as much as I, I have in previous years. It's tough to get uh, really into it in the middle of August. I've got a lot of other things going at the moment, and it, it, the only thing I miss from it. Um, is you know playoff hockey is so much about the crowd and so much about the atmosphere that it's that that's been a little tough and uh, really? i miss yeah. that oh. but i've loved uh, it i've loved it it's been great i think they've done a marvelous job oh the, i think the league has done an amazing job of how the arenas look i think mm -hmm. they've done the best job the nba playoffs look good but because they've brought the the screens in so close to the to the court, uh, it looks so small. Whereas the, uh, I think the arenas look yeah. great. The two yeah, arenas yeah. have done a terrific job. The NBA, job. it looks like a gym. That's it looks yeah, just like absolutely. a gym. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Whereas the, uh, the NHL have made it look big. I love the use of the monitor, the big monitors on one side. Mm -hmm. And the guys who are doing audio, John and I like to geek out on the TV production side, but the guys who are doing the audio, to add the the crowd enhancements, they've been doing an outstanding job. I think it's Jeff Kozak in Edmonton, and we. Uh, I was talking to a former uh, director that both Larry or both uh, John and I worked with, Larry Brown, and he was marveling that Jeff Kozak was throwing in some oohs and ahs when there was a post hit. Well, I mean, the 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 magic of that is is as as we get deeper into the bubbles, they become much more comfortable with when to use it, how to use it. Yeah. You know, when you're doing three games a day, you they get tired too. When you only have one game a day, you can actually plan it a little more. I, I, I do think that at key times when you get a referee wiping out a goal and you can hear a murmur, mm -hmm. uh, it does make it a little more effective. That's pretty impressive. The only thing I was a little surprised at, again, from a TV standpoint, I thought – because there is nobody in the stands that they might have found a few more new camera angles or different camera angles that we wouldn't normally be able Agreed. to do with, uh, with crowd in the stands. They've used the, the crane camera that NBC developed underneath the scoreboard, which has been all right. But I, I would have thought they could have done a couple of other things, but I, I, I think they did have to go. And I I've been saying this all along through the pandemic. They had to, they had an opportunity to go lower and closer. Mm -hmm. uh, and quite frankly, they haven't gone lower and closer. They've gone higher and wider. Uh, yeah. With with the it's it's called a it's called a jitta, jib in the air. Uh, yeah. So it, and and that's the one thing that it, it's, it's effective. Sure, I don't want to see it. I mean, we, we all everybody has problems watching the puck anyway and following the puck, even if you're Canadian, mm -hmm. and you trust the game camera to go with the flow so you trust that the puck is going that way well the new high wide jitta camera doesn't really move very much so you don't know where the puck is and you don't yeah. fall you don't follow the flow of the puck and, and so much of our game is about flow as opposed to mm -hmm. i see that little one inch thick three inch black dot on the yep. ice you have to they have to find a way lower and closer would have been my preference uh, but, uh, you know, from a world feed sense and replays, I think they're, they've done okay. They, they, haven't, they haven't embarrassed themselves, that's for sure. Yeah, but if you watch the NBA, they did the low tracking camera along the one side. 
and they can do that because there's nobody sitting courtside, right? Right. So right. could well, you have done something more like that on hockey? But those things, those things well, are expensive. And here, here, okay, here's what I would have done. Right now. Here's, here's what I would have done. And I'm, I, I, I actually lobbied a few people. And I wasn't going to say it, but now that you're here, I was, I'll say it. What I would have done was because there's no stands, I would have moved the stands back 10 feet. Mm-hmm. And I would have allowed for on the concrete outside the boards, I would have put two steady cams mm-hmm. and put a steady cam so that cameraman could walk from behind the goal all the way to the penalty box on either side. And so he could have followed play, but he could also move to set up plays. He could, because it's a steady cam, you could ped down. You could do a lot more with two steady cams in the corners than typical handhelds because there's no photographers. Yep. There's nobody in your way. You could own yep. that area. Uh, and I just, I, I and, and steady cams aren't that expensive and everybody, they're, they're, they're easily rentable. Uh, yep. It would have been, it would have, I think it would have been a good way to get lower and closer to the game. All right. Can you two geeks shut up for a second here? Um, here's six the pro- people will six people will put a star beside that idea, Bob, and like the podcast for it. Yeah, and they and they all work in television. <laughs> um, here's the problem with that that idea, and 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 it's and look at I, I I don't really know what you're talking about. I mean, I I can assimilate it sort of, but the problem is this: we assume COVID is not going to last forever although maybe um so you 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 experiment with these kinds of things that you've got john and next year you can't use it at all and the dilemma becomes if they are really good now you can't go back to it i don't i bob if they're really good there's always a way no, you can't. There's well, then find way. the way without moving sta- stands back well, then, listen, and by, doing it by, in by, a COVID you, environment. You move the stands back, Bob. And by the way, when you say we're going to have two rows of less seats, it's not the expensive ones that go away. Mm. <laughs> no, you just move those back up two rows. That's right. No, it's I the get cheap that. cheap ones that go away. I'm just saying, it, it, you, I agree with a bit of experimentation. But at the same time, I mean, I, I think that in, in order to try to, I think that's one of the biggest differences when the NBA is, is playing is, is that, you know, the ball is bigger. There's no uh, glass or boards between the players and, uh, uh, and the cameras. And uh, the sounds are p- more pure because of that. No, they can so, do I mean, more. They can do more. So they could do more. That's more. all I'm saying. What would, if you were still running Sportsnet, and I know a couple people here that wish you still were. Um, I, I can't attest to any more than two, but yes, <laughs> but two, two, uh, well, it, maybe one and a half. Who used to be on half. the payroll? Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, would you be? Would you have been more aggressive in new concepts? Um, you know, I, I, I like to think that the team there was always trying to, to innovate. Um, when we first got the contract in 2014, we pushed by our, uh, our former CEO, Guy Lawrence, uh, we, we really tried to come up with some new and different angles. That's how the ref cam came to be. Um, and yeah, I think this would have been an opportunity, but you're always constrained with logistics, right? And it's easy as outsiders now to yeah. talk about what they could have done, should have done. We don't know their budgets. We don't know what the league was doing. And, and remember, they're putting this together in a, in a short timeline, right? Um, oh, they've, so, been meeting, they've been meeting since May. They, yeah. They've had meetings since May. And this thing, when you talk about television costs, this thing costs between 50 and $70 million overall. Yeah. This is, you know, and, and so if you wanted to sit, tell me that I wanted to spend another three hundred thousand dollars on steady cams, please, it's a drop yeah. in the bucket. If they, if they yeah. had wanted to do it, they could have done it. I think what I'm missing, and maybe it's out there and I haven't seen it, is uh, bubble life. What's it like in the bubble? You know, I I, I think that would be fascinating because you know, as I'm watching, I was, yeah. Well, well, the, well, the teams have done a I, the teams have done a really good job with it on their on their digital stuff. Some of it, and yeah, and, sure. and and the NHL's done it, and NBC is running it. NBC mm. runs features on Bubble Life all the time. 
that we, we don't haven't see seen those that on in, the Canadian. We side? don't see that in Canada. No. Yeah. Well, I think that might be a little bit of a miss because I was trying to explain to uh, Becky, who both of you guys know as my wife, uh, yesterday, that if if I'm a veteran uh, playing, and I was I was just using the NBA as an example yesterday. If I'm if I'm playing for the Nets yesterday. Uh, and I'm 35 plus, um, how hard am I really trying? Because I want to get the heck out of the bubble and get home and see my family. So I think that's one of the added interesting things about life in the bubble in both sports mm -hmm. is you know, how motivated are, especially guys who've already won the Stanley Cup or who have got their contracts uh, already guaranteed for next year. You know, they haven't seen their family or their kids in a long time. This is this is hardship, and you can say these guys make millions and millions of dollars, but they're in uh, they're in minimum security prisons right now. By yeah. the way, they, they, there's no paychecks. There's no paychecks yeah. Yeah. when yeah, they're exactly. getting about they're, they're yeah. in the bubble right yep. now. So, yep. so now this is a, uh, there. This has been an interesting time. Uh, heck, the, it's been an interesting time. I think since last November when when Don got let go, mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, Black Lives Matters and diversity. Uh, which we all have to be very respectful of. Uh, but in the last week or so, we've seen two incidents, Tom Brenneman in Cincinnati, uh, who got caught with a hot mic, uh, and Mike Milbury. And you're, an old, you're a CEO. You have been through these issues. How, how, do, how, does, how do you handle those? What's the internal discussion like um, when, when somebody says, we've got a problem, Scott, and you have to fix it? And you have to fix it before we go on the air tomorrow. Yeah. Um, I think those challenges have gotten more exasperated because of the political climate. Um, I think as a, as a CEO, as an executive, you used to be able to think, did Don or Tom or Mike intend to offend anybody? Uh, now you have to think, was anybody offended? Uh, it's more ab about the receiver than the than the offender, and you have to be even more careful than you had been before. I went through one with uh, with Mike um, at Hockey Night in Canada when I was at CBC. He he referred to the sissification of hockey. Mm -hmm. um, which he thought was a relatively harmless way of saying that it had gotten too gentle. And my boss at the time received a complaint from Rick Mercer. Uh, and he said to me, Scott, you'd better fix this. And it's, it's a, uh, there are various different ways you can try and fix it. In that situation, we got Mike to apologize. And sometimes that's how you, how you solve it. I do think we need to be careful going forward that, and I don't like when people say political correctness is a bad thing. I think you have to be careful and you have to be, you have to be sensitive to your audience. But um, for people to be fired for slips of tongues or things that they didn't mean to be offensive uh, in a very sensitive time, you know, are these fireable effect, offenses? And sometimes I got to think maybe they're not, but mm. we're all you know, very, very sensitive to our audiences and but, for the most part, for the right reasons, right? But, so but, yeah, I, I saw it happen and play out with Don, uh, now with, with, uh, with Tom Brenneman, which by the way, there's, there's one that we've solved, I don't know how many times, John, uh, where mm. we've told audio operators, just keep the mics closed during commercial breaks. You shouldn't exactly. have open mics in commercial breaks. And by the way, anybody who's been in the, in the business long enough should know, don't say anything stupid in front of an open mic, whether you think you're in commercial or not. Yeah. Or just don't say anything stupid. Well, that would be helpful. But we all, mm. we've all said stupid things um, you know, at various levels, right? Um, Hopefully they're not offensive. Hopefully they're not hateful. When they yeah. are either of those two things, then you've got to deal with it. So, so, uh, so let's talk about the Brenneman one in particular, uh, where he used a, a homophobic slur. Um, yeah. I mean, Fox, Fox and the Reds were very quick to get him to apologize and get him off the air within the same game. Yeah. Um, 
which it, in my mind was commendable. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, what do you do now? And this is, we're talking the Brenneman name in Cincinnati. This is a legendary family. Um, his dad, Barty, was, is, in, is in the Hall of Fame. Uh, and he, Tom has already been taken off Fox football because of this. Yeah. Uh, what is there any, does he have any rope? Does he have it? Do, do, does he have a grace period? Does he, is this a suspendable thing? Is this a fireable thing? What is it? I, I would, I would hope now, unless there's a, a history that we're unaware of, right. And maybe there is, maybe there isn't. If there is a history of saying stupid, uh, homophobic things like that, then it's probably a fireable offense. If there isn't, maybe it's a suspendable offense. You come out, you do, uh, you, you do an apology, you make it sincere, you make sure there's some sensitivity training. Who was, Bob, who was the, uh, the Blue Jays player who came out with the, uh, the black underneath his eyes a couple of years ago? Oh, the um, shortstop. The shortstop. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm trying to remember. It wasn't that. Reyes, was but, it? No, no, no. No, no, it was wasn't that. Reyes. Um, it'll come to me but you know that one he apologized um he it wasn't a great apology but he apologized and and he took sensitivity training you know the the goal posts are moving for the right reason in our society that we need to be more sensitive in our language but it takes time to make sure that everybody's up to speed and and that people don't slip from time to time and, and so we, you know, I don't do think Milbury, it then? should be a death sentence. What would I have done with Milbury? Yeah. I mean, they've sent him home. Oh. Yeah, they sent him home. You know, this one is the perfect example of it's not about whether he intended to offend. It's the fact that uh, a large number of, of people were offended by it. I think we all know, know what he meant to say. He meant to say, as a former coach, as a former general manager, it's – sort of ideal to be in a bubble situation where there are no distractions. And he, but he tried to do it in a funny way that's frankly no longer funny. Um, it's like your, your uncle telling a joke that might have been funny in the 60s or might have been acceptable in the 60s and some people laughed even though they knew it wasn't acceptable. Now you can't, you can't say those things. And you know, I think we're a better place because of it but it's going to take time, especially for people who grew up in the 60s, 70s, where some of these things did get say, said, and they need to make sure that they know that you can't say it. Well, let me, let me throw my two cents in here as somebody yeah. who you know spent 45 years on the air and, and never really got, surprisingly, into this kind of trouble. I mean, the worst trouble yep. I got into was with Cito Gaston, and that had nothing to do with, with mm-hmm. anything except that Cito thought I was a racist because I didn't like him. Yep. Um, I think the word intent is really an important word here. And it's yes. a difficult one because, um, you know, an individual who makes a mistake can plead that he had no intent to offend uh, and can just say it and n- not mean it. So it is up to somebody like you more mm-hmm. to somehow determine whether the intent was real or was this a slip of the tongue? The thing is, you know, broadcasters like us and this environment is in my mind, no different than, than broadcasting. You know, I don't use profanity on this show. I could, Mm -hmm. um, I'm just trained not to. Um, I can swear like a sailor when I'm off the air, but, but, but I'm not going to do it in this environment. You're doing hours of live broadcasting, live talk. Sometimes things come out of people's mouths. And there's, is there a person out there more? You, John, me, or anybody watching or listening to this that has not slipped at least once and mm-hmm. said something that they thought was funny or amusing or whatever, but turned out to be offensive? We've all done it. Mm-hmm. And and to to end a career because of that just seems to me to be a complete and total overreaction. And I believe that's where we are in the broadcasting industry today. Everybody is so afraid of their shadow 
that they're going to dump on somebody rather than take the heat. Agree or yeah, disagree? I, I, I agree with you. I think you, what we're asking of, of broadcasters and their bosses is to deliver swift career death sentences for mistakes. Yeah, exactly. You can go rob a bank and you'll go to jail for a few years and you'll get out, hopefully reformed and not rob a bank again. So if you make a, a mistake that's not habitual, wasn't intentful, um, then maybe you should have a chance to apologize, move on. And that's tough when you've got the Twitterverse calling for heads every day. The rush to judge, the rush to judgment, Scott. The rush to judgment is really harsh. Yeah, and I, I'll tell you something, and I know Don Cherry would not be upset with me relaying this story because I think it's it's very illustrative. So I can remember when we first got the contract and I went to go meet with Don in Vancouver, they were doing the outdoor game or the quasi outdoor game in Vancouver. And I sat with them at the, at the Weston in Vancouver and said, we wanted to hire him at Rogers. And I said, here's one of the differences that you're going to find working with Rogers is if you say something offensive at the CBC, People are going to write and people are going to get mad at the CBC. They're going to call the government and say, you should stop funding the CBC. If you say something offensive at Rogers, there may be tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people that decide to, to stop subscribing to Rogers services because they're supporting you. So you're going to have to be even more careful about what you say. And I'll give Don a ton of credit that he was very much more careful when he came over to Rogers and he was always aware of that. But, you know, he, he said something that uh, was offensive to many and there was a, a very loud call for swift, swift movement on it. And what happened happened. And I've said publicly, whether you want uh, to construe this as me supporting what he said or not, I'm, I'm not supporting what he said, but I think it's a tough way for, uh, his career to have ended. And I, well, and I feel, I feel badly about that. The, let's clarify something here. Cause uh, you know, I, I know you, you, you know, all the, uh, where all the bodies are buried on this, but, and Don was on with us, although we didn't get into it in, in any great depth. But the story is that Don was called in on, I believe the Monday morning after the incident, which was, I think a Saturday night mm -hmm. and um, was given the opportunity to go on the air and apologize for what he said. He declined that opportunity. And as a result, the decision was made to terminate him. And it, I don't know this for a fact, but if one, and one, if one and one equals two, that means that if he had agreed to apologize, he could have stayed on the air. Mm -hmm. Is that, as you understand it, John? I, I, I believe that, yeah. I don't yeah. think uh, your, your timing is, might be a little different, but yes, I, I believe that that was true, yeah. Scott Moore is shaking I, his head a little bit. You, you, what, do you, what do you think, I, what do you know? I talked to Don. I think he, he would have apologized, but I don't know that he would have apologized in the way that uh, Rogers would have needed when him go, to apologize. Well, it, 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 would have had, it would have had to have been scripted. Let's face it, it would have had yeah. to have been scripted. And 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 I uh, and and Don would would not have have done that. Um, the the interesting thing about all of this is is that uh, you know broadcast executives um, have paid and want people to be polarizing. They want mm -hmm. to create yep. reaction. You know Mike Milbury, yep. who's who, who I've known Mike since he played, uh, had some great discussions with Mike. Had some great arguments with Mike. Um, I don't agree with a lot of the things that Mike does, but you know, Sam flooded NBC hired him because he was Mike Milbury, not because he was, yep. was milk toast, not because he was the greatest analyst in the history of the game, but because he was Mike Milbury. Um, and, and, and he crossed a line. He crossed a line that he should not have crossed. No, but they asked. They're asking that's, people that's to walk point, a tight rope, and then that's, the minute they slip and fall off that tight rope, they want to get rid of them. That's my they point. They want to save Bob. their own asses. That's, that's what the problem is. That's yeah. my point. 
that is yeah. that is completely my point is that this you know and and i mean nbc went through the same thing with with jeremy roenick yes you know yeah. and and so at what point do at what point does the system uh, get um analyzed a bit better is my, my question and what point okay so what are we doing how are we hiring these people is this the right way to be hiring this type of person or philosophically should we stop being uh, more uh, much more editorial and and le and more analysis as opposed to what we what what some networks have now i mean that's it's an interesting one it, 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 I, I watched the golf yesterday uh, and and there was not one ounce of criticism of anything even if the guy shanked his w wedge there was not going to be that's just not the way golf works and um, you, you know what in other sports uh, particularly in the sport that we cover a lot in hockey boy oh boy you get paid to be negative you get paid to be negative and that's Scott, to me that's here. an issue yeah uh, i i think there's an there's an extra problem um and the extra problem and you have already already identified it with Brenneman, um there's there's a call for absolute instant or swift justice mm -hmm. and yeah. get that person off the air before the end of the game or in in don's case i think he was fired within two or three days um i would i would compare it maybe to how uh, our friend brad treleving handled his coaching problem in in calgary yeah. when his coach was was accused of uttering racial slurs and people were calling for his head and brad said we're going to get to the bottom of this you're going to have to be patient because this is a man who's put uh, years and years into his craft and we're going to make sure that we have it all right before we make uh, our, our judgment and it took probably three or four days longer than most people wanted to and they came to the conclusion that they were going to fire their coach um but they didn't do it based on the twitterverse saying it has to be done now because you would not convict a person of uh, of uh, robbing a bank in 24 without hours a trial. without a trial and you know i i think that's going to be the biggest challenge for people in my old position or in who are running other networks is that call for swift justice. We heard what he said, we know what he meant, or we know what she meant, and they have to be fired. Well, how, do you, how do you measure social media? I mean, yeah. I remember Jay, Feast, Jay Feaster, the former general manager of the Calgary Flames, uh, had a great line one day when somebody asked him about a trade and this and that, and he says, listen, I am not gonna respond to somebody who was 13 years old in his underwear in his basement. <laughs> uh, because, I mean, you, you can be nameless and faceless and throw something in social media and who knows it's accurate and who knows it's fair and yet it, it may get some life. So yeah. what, as, as, a, as a suit, when you're sitting there in your beautiful corner office with your 29 monitors and your Emmys and everything like that, what, um, not that I, I know that you had that, um, but, <laughs> but, but how much, yeah, how, mu how, how much, how much, <laughs> How much did you, how much did you measure what social media did? How much the how much around the people around you measure social media? Yeah, you have to use social media as a tool, not the the final arbiter. Um, but that's a whole other interesting issue: is how your staff, your commentators, are using social media themselves. Because how many people? that we know of in the last two or three years have lost their jobs because of something stupid they've done on social media. You know, I'm just and, trying to get and, free golf and, clubs. <laughs> yeah, and, and by the way, you know, and, and Bob was brilliant at this uh, in the last few years that he was at Rogers, you know, social media was swirling all around you, Bob, but you didn't participate. Nope. You just didn't participate. And, you know, there are a ton of people in our industry too many in my opinion who feel a need to engage on social media and argue on social media and respond to every troll i have a rule like if you don't agree with me that's fine you say something rude to me i'm blocking you and if you want to argue with me i don't argue with people with less than five followers like uh you're just coming on there to be to be difficult 
but there are there are people we know in this industry who want to engage with every critic on social media and then you're you're asking for trouble somewhere down the road mm. <laughs> Uh, we could go on and on, and we um, could. this has been fun, and and, and more doubt, doubtless would go on and on. <laughs> it's um, just nice to be called by you, Bob. You you, you, you haven't good. gone back to visit your old office, and and I reason I reason I ask this is because I I remember this vividly more. When you wandered into um, uh, Rogers for the first time and took over that corner office, you remember what you pledged, if not publicly, then privately. Because I was there when you pledged it. Lifetime contract for Bob? No. The office, well, he did say that, too. <laughs> um, well, I outlasted him at the very least. Not by too. much, big boy. No. <laughs> well, as soon as Moore left, that was the end of me. So, uh, no, he, he, he had this big-ass office that was way too big for anybody, and especially Scott Moore, and pledged to reduce the size of it, cut it in half. You recall that? I don't recall saying that, but yes. I do recall. Yes, you oh, did. No, no. He, you, you know, by the way, you know, and, and, and you know, the guy that had the office before, he was Doug Beforth. He's a, a, my college roommate and a friend of mine. But you know what you said to me about that office? What? Me? It has, no, 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 Scott. He said, it has windows because Doug liked yeah. it dark. Yeah. <laughs> you opened the blinds and it was but light I, outside. I got it. Did, just because I loved that was such a great office. It was the size of my my second apartment, probably. Oh. Um, but uh, when Guy Lawrence came in, remember, he came in as the CEO of Rogers and said, "We're getting rid of all the offices and we're starting with Scott Moore's." Uh, because it, when Beforth built the office, it was actually the biggest uh, biggest office in the entire Rogers building. Fantastic. So I'm proud to say that. That guy got rid of a lot of offices, but by the time Guy uh, was uh, asked to uh, vacate the building, I still had my office. And so by the he way, didn't get to me. By the way, <laughs> offices are coming back because of COVID. They are absolutely the the, the open concepts don't work in COVID. I saw it coming. You could social distance like twenty people in that office. Yeah, <laughs> be perfect. Right. Well, and for the first five years I worked for you, you did for me. So, it's unbelievable. <laughs> Bob, it's good to see it. Uh, congratulations see you, on the podcast. Well, it's, you know, it's what's something to do. It's uh, and it's not, you know, it's not going to be, it's for John, who has uh, nothing yeah. to do and yeah, no true. life whatsoever. And I've got, a, I, I have, I've pledged to look after him for my, the rest of my miserable little life here or his. And so that, hence, we're doing we are, we are, we are recording and clipping that. Uh, God uh, you look beautiful. We wish you uh, continued uh, success. And uh, who knows? We may uh, give you a dingle somewhere down the road and uh, get you back on. We'll talk about some other stuff. All right. Okay. Well, you know what we should do? We should get. We should. We should recruit Pelly at some point and have things. Oh, that'd be fun. Two on at the same time. Oh, that'd be fun. We have some good stories. We could, we had some good Bob McCown stories. To be and, fair. and some of them uh, might even be true. Maybe, this, maybe that was yeah. a bad idea on my part. Then now that <laughs> yeah. I think of it. Oh, he'll do it. He'll do it for sure. Uh, the CEO of Uninterrupted Canada, the uh, former president of uh, Rogers Sportsnet, Scott Moore. Uh, we thank you for watching or listening wherever you are. Uh, check us out next time. Goodbye from Toronto.